Thank you, everybody, for joining. Just to ensure that you're in the right room, this is the conversation on fintech. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'd first, like to thank, I'd first like to thank the audience. I know that everybody's very busy, especially probably after late nights with beautiful views and cocktails for showing up so early. I'd also like to thank Swift and Cybos for organizing this, as well as my panel members who are clearly very busy and taking time out to attend today and lead the discussion. By way of introduction, I'm Jason Eckberg. I'll be the panel moderator. Um, I'll make every effort to make this lively uh, and hopefully an enjoyable discussion. I'm a partner at Oliver Wyman. Today we have an hour, 45 minutes, I think approximately, to really to talk about market liberalization and the role of regulatory supervision. Just to give some context for today's conversation, historically in previous years, the discussion was more around the benefits of financial market liberalization. I think recent events globally, regionally, and in some of the key domestic Asian markets, we've seen that those strategies cannot occur without a proper regulatory framework. And so this raises systemic questions in regards to what role do restrictions and regulatory frameworks play? Do they hinder or will they actually accelerate overall integration and market development? With that said, we're going to be focusing today's discussion on six questions uh, for which I'm going to be working with the panel to address them. We're also going to have two polling questions that we're going to ask you to participate in. Uh, I understand the polling is quite simple. There's buttons that have numbers. Our questions have numbers. You just choose one, two, three, or four, and then hit green. If there's any questions, we uh, will do our best to help you, but it should be quite simple. So the six questions we're going to be focusing on today, number one, drivers of capital market integration and harmonization. We'll start off with that one. We'll then talk about which parts of the value chain in the securities market are actually integrating and why and why not. And then we're going to talk about discussions on challenges and harmonization and ultimately get the panelists' views on if they had three things that are must-dos, what would they do? We'll then talk about why is integration happening more at a regional versus global level, especially when many of the markets and investors are global in nature. We'll also talk about what that means for who's going to benefit and who's going to benefit less as part of the integration. And then we're going to talk about what are some of the obstacles going forward that we need to consider. So with that said, I just want to take a few moments to introduce the panel members. So we have Roland, who's joining us from Commerce Bank. He's the divisional head of global markets. We have, let's see if I've got the names behind him. Next. We've got Stephanie Morell, the APAC head of clearing and custody for BNP Paribas. Next. We have Sean Tuffy, senior vice president, head of global regulatory intelligence for BBH. And then we have Joe, who's joining us for head of product management for Euroclear. With that said, why don't we go ahead and get started. So I open this up to each of the panel members uh, with the first question. What is your view on the underlying drivers of capital market integration and harmonizations. You can give a view globally, regionally, as you like. Starting off with you, Roland. I would say uh, market harmonization is a driver for economic growth. We need it. And if I take Europe as an example, uh, since the financial crisis, we are facing in some of the European countries all-time highs in unemployment rates, especially in for the young people, which is, in my eyes, very dangerous. Second topic I would like to raise, we need to find new ways of financing innovations. Mm. And uh, I would like, uh, if I will be the owner of the capital market harmonization, I would like to contain it five points. First of all, we need to regain trust in the financial markets. Secondly, we need to increase further financial stability. Thirdly, as I said before, we need alternatives in financing new innovations. We need increasing transparency. And fifth, but not lastly, we need a harmonization of local standards and regulations. Harmonization not only in Europe, harmonization globally. This is my view on the capital markets harmonization. All right, so thank you, Holland. I'm not going to spend so much time, and I, I'm actually relieved to um, see that uh, I got that answer right. <laughs> my first point was also to foster growth. 
Um, so, as you said, that's in the preamble of the Capital Markets Union in Europe. So I'm not going to spend so much time on the, to elaborate on this. Um, that can also be said about China uh, and their efforts to uh, harmonize uh, and integrate into their, their different markets. Having reached uh, GP per capita of uh, 6,800 US dollars last year, as you know, the Chinese economy is at a tipping point, and they also have a growth uh, challenge. Um, and they also view that integrating their capital markets further in the global economy, uh, being uh, through connecting their stock exchanges to a variety of stock exchanges in the world, or internationalizing their currency, um, are two of their answers as well. So in that respect, I'd say China is also using the same tools as Europe to foster growth. Sean? Yeah, I think uh, when I look at the, so the drivers, I think there are two. I think the, uh, Stephanie and Roland touched on the first one, which is the desire for growth um, and the desire to sort of better allocate capital and look for alternative financing. And I think that's a very much a regional story. You know, you talk about the EU, you talk about greater China, you talk about uh, ASEAN looking to do things like this. But then internationally, I, I think it's a slightly different push on the harmonization, and it's much more about macroprudential regulation and stability and trying to look for risk reduction um, in the system. So if you look at sort of OTC clearing rules that we're trying to sort of harmonize across the globe, that is as much about avoiding the mistakes of the past as it is about harmonization growth. So I think there are sometimes complementary, sometimes competing uh, drivers uh, for the, the capital markets harmonization. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, if I look at sort of harmonization, I think there's two. This on the one hand, you have regulatory harmonization, you have market harmonization. I think they have different uh, different drivers. For sure, you start when you talk about harmonization, you start from something in common, and either you have sort of a, a need in common or you have a problem in common. Um, I think regulatory harmonization that's typically driven by a shared political need. So you have indeed a single market or you share a single currency, that's the sort of uh, Europe, or it's driven by a crisis. And 2008 with all the, uh, the consequential uh, OTC uh, derivatives regulation. And that's typically then where you, have, you see that imposed by global bodies like, uh, like the Financial Stability Board, IOSCO, BIS and all that. Um, and I think you will see more regulation sort of, which is crisis driven, coming back on stability that is going to be, to be sort of global, uh, uh, globally driven or globally regulated. Of course, the complication is the implementation of all that uh, into, into local, uh, local uh, jurisdiction. And you see that with the whole implementation of Dodd-Frank and Emir, the time it takes. I mean, Dodd-Frank was there first, 2013, but you see Emir is still uh, being implemented. So that, I think, is sort of crisis driven. The second one is market harmonization thing that is more driven by um, sort of the need to reduce cost uh, efficiency, typically, at least what we see, investor-driven. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, need for harmonization for the investors to be able, in particular for Asia, Latin America, harmonization is a way to access markets uh, in, uh, in an easier way. Um, the approach that we take from a Euroclear's perspective is that we start to look more from an issuer's perspective, from a country's perspective, because, of course, all these local markets see all of these investors wanting to have easy access into, into their countries. I think we first need to understand what is the need for a particular country, yeah? because they, are, they, they do have different needs. There are different stages of a development. Understand their needs. Listen to local authorities. What do they try to achieve? What are their concerns? And then once you address those concerns, then you look at how you, harmonize, how you implement it in such a way that indeed it doesn't hamper uh, investment flows, but you start always from the need of a particular country. Yeah. So, Stephanie, going back, because you made some points on China, but also just kind of your broader experience globally, but also regionally, where do you actually see integration happening and why? Um, so, we've seen um, integration um, in growing or taking different angles, because I think one of the elements or one of the points of discussion we're going to have is that not all markets <coughs> have reached the same stage of development. Um, so, of course, some regions or some markets have to start by the beginning. Certainly in the region, uh, integration has been happening between, as I said, uh, linking stock exchanging or connecting markets 
from different angles, such as creating passport initiatives and funds in the Asian uh, countries. Um, and the way we see it starting normally are business drivers. Mm. Um, if you want to foster growth, which is one of the premises that we established as a key driver, uh, and while ensuring investor protection, which is also a concern uh, for the markets that are engaging into this, uh, this uh, journey of, uh, of liberalization or harmonization, uh, and, and thirdly, while preventing systemic risk, which is another uh, key driver, um, they always start with the trading element. So what is the business driver? What is going to bring more business to their uh, given market? Um, and, and that's exactly normally how the scheme starts, by the trading layer. Now, so trading is the enabler, but sometimes uh, they forget the post-trade elements, um, and that's where difficulties start. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, so you, you raised the point on prudential regulation. I guess, what role do you see regulation playing in driving this harmonization? Yeah, I mean, I think, especially at the, the macroprudential standpoint, uh, uh, to, to Joe's point, I think increasingly it's being driven um, by, these, by the international bodies, be it the G20, IOSCO, um, or, or the FSB um, to sort of set the principled framework around, you know, OTC clearing or uh, bank capital rules for, for CIPI. Um, but these are all very much about harmonizing rules to, to sort of stamp out risk from the system, and, and they're not as much about trying to encourage growth. And, and sometimes that can come in conflict. So you have in Europe, um, you know, the, the new Basel rules are coming in, but they're, they're concerned that they're going to choke off um, securization more than they need to. So there's always a sort of give and take, and the challenge, the challenge with all international sort of policies or frameworks is that, that we don't have supernatural regulators, right? Not supernational regulators. So we don't have, IOSCO has no enforcement power, the FSB has no enforcement power. So you do have this give and take between what the international bodies are trying to do and then the, the local uh, regulators or regional regulators with their own specific policies. So I think that's one of the sort of the, the core challenges. But I think to Stephanie's point that it's a com it, the market need certainly does start the conversation, but I think it's almost always then you, you need some sort of policy drive and you need some sort of um, real push to get it over the line. And I think that's where when you look at Europe and you look at the, the opening up the uh, Capital Markets Union or the recently uh, T the, the beginning of the implementation of T2S and the, the move to uh, T plus two settlement, you had the, the underpinning of the EU Yep. legal framework and the political will and the ability to push these through and that makes it a lot easier to do. Yeah. It's interesting. I th you said supernational. I actually thought you were going to say supernatural <laughs> and I was interested <laughs> where the conversation was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, just kind of, I guess, shifting gears to you, given your role from a, a market infrastructure perspective and the role that you play kind of uh, regionally and internationally, what do you see as some of the main challenges for harmonization and integration? Well, typically, if you look at harmonization, I, from, a, from a pure infrastructure point of view, I would start with saying the more data you need to sort of process, the more difficult it is to harmonize. So that's coming back to your point. Indeed, the trading side, I think, is much easier than sort of the post-trade side. You know? um, also, if you look at from a payments processing point of view, from a trading processing point of view, there you have no sort of uh, securities or property uh, law uh, tax impacts and all these kind of things. So. Once you start to touch upon securities markets, there indeed you have a much larger number of barriers to, in, to, uh, to remove because you had typically you, you have to implement or you hit the uh, uh, local laws. So that's why harmonization typically on the post trade side is, uh, is more complex. And frankly, if you look at the number of initiatives, I think there have been a lot of initiatives started by sort of by the market or market driven initiatives uh, to, to harmonize, but in the end, I think the, the only way to execute them and to get there is, is, is with the regulatory push. Yeah? Uh, you saw that with SEPA, you saw that with Giovannini barriers, you see that with, uh, with T plus two, with target to securities, all that requires sort of a, a strong regulatory push. We had in our market, we had an example which was the, uh, the easiest markets, which was sort of the harmonization of the three, uh, uh, France, Belgium, and, and Holland into, uh, into a single market. Those were three small markets, yeah? and that took, even that took three years to harmonize. Yeah? So uh, you look at Europe as a whole, it's quite uh, uh, 
Uh, it's quite complex. Uh, crisis, that's my, my earlier point, that's the difference. I mean, if it's driven by sort of more economic and common interest and all that, it sort of takes longer. If there's a crisis behind, we say we don't see derivatives, you'd suddenly see that sort of global move because there's bigger things at stake. There is market stability, there is systemic risk at stake, there is contagious risk, extraterritoriality. Then the drive typically is, uh, or you have a, a much stronger push into, uh, into harmonization. Yeah. So you raised the point on the post-trade layer being the challenges, be it payments, be it taxation, be it collateral management. Just to kind of take out of the box kind of view, do you think this integration can happen without a regulatory framework, i.e. the private sector driving it alone? Or is it something that there has to be a regulatory framework in place before harmonization can happen? No, I think, well, you can, I think, market infrastructure size, we, we, we work very closely with the industry and we start to, whether you call it harmonization or standardization, but of course we don't stand still. Huh? So we have taken a lot of initiatives from an infrastructure point of view, uh, not going to go in details, but on the collateral side, collateral highway, our joint venture with the DTCC. So we take actions in parallel, but I think to go to, f to true harmonization, I think, yes, you need some, uh, some regulatory push. Yeah. The two go hand in hand, but if you want to really push it to the end, I think some regulatory uh, drive is necessary. Yeah. So then shifting to Stephanie, and I feel like we're banging a little bit of ping pong, so apologies here. <laughs> so Stephanie, if you, had, if you had basically three arrows uh, to basically shoot at harmonization, what would be your three priorities? Um, so I'd say, um, unfortunately, um, this is a little bit of a you know, dirty job that we have to do by harmonizing. Uh, harmonizing on paper is one thing. If you want it to translate into reality, there's an element of data harmonization that needs to be done. And uh, referring back to the, this example, um, aligning the definition, speaking the same language, the same concepts, this was the most difficult part. And those were markets that belonged to the same mm. region and had some sort of proximity already. Um, so data harmonization is definitely takes a lot of time and a lot of effort um, and implementing standards or defining common standards. So accepting the fact that your market will need to change and converge to be suitable mm -hmm. to another market and agreeing common standards. In that respect, of course, our main instrument is SWIFT, yeah. to be fair. Uh, I think as an industry, we're pretty lucky. We uh, had the very good idea of creating this, um, and that has been instrumental. So uh, for, for us, it's uh, a key tool that will need to be continued to be used. So just kind of wearing your Asia hat now, uh, Asia, as we all very well know, is a very different set of countries, but they're very different market dynamics. Uh, you've got China and the recent kind of volatility that one has seen in the market there. Um, we also look in Southeast Asia, and the markets are at very different paces. Singapore clearly stands out as you know, a leader, but then you have Indonesia and other very uh, fast-growing markets that fundamentally need capital markets to finance growth going forward. So I guess, how would you think about the role of harmonization uh, and the importance in Asia and ASEAN more broadly? Um, it, it is a journey. So it, I, in my opinion, it can't be decided completely top-down. There needs to be a convergence of points of views and a willingness and a desire to, to work together. Um, we have seen some sub-poles uh, starting to create around ASEAN, for example, uh, or around uh, greater China. And, and I think that's the journey that they're gonna, that they're starting to engage in. So um, what has been done in, in Europe uh, is likely to, to also start uh, happening in, in, in Asia. So then just drilling in a little bit deeper on mutual fund recognition in Asia, is it gonna be success or not success? Oh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> Um, so we are, um, at BNP Paribas, we're very strong supporters of cross-border initiatives. We think that in isolation, a given market is not likely to grow. 
Um, so cross-border initiatives, um, and, and one of them is passporting of funds, um, de deserve our, our very strong support and commitment. And as you know, we've been completely engaged into rolling out the Asian passports. Yeah. Um, we were at the forefront of launching the schemes with uh, uh, trusted clients such as Maybank or Fullerton. Um, so we're fully engaged in those passport initiatives and the MRF is also one of them. So we are very keen on promoting uh, those schemes, explaining what they mean, and currently we're very engaged into uh, enabling our European clients um, to start setting up their Hong Kong funds in order to benefit from this. So uh, we, we bank on that, we bank on the success. Okay. Yeah, if I may add, I think the, the mutual fund passports are an interesting initiative for the region, and I don't think we should underestimate the, the challenges that they face in terms of trying to harmonize the tax rules and the distribution rules. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, we did a survey of global asset managers, and 34% thought there was a medium to high chance that by 2025, uh, one of the passport schemes, be it the, the ACNCIS, the MRF, or the ARFP, would replace USIS as sort of the dominant cross-border fund in the region. So. Uh, there certainly is, uh, in the market, I think, some excitement about the development of these local products. And I, I think that's, if you look at sort of usage that I just mentioned, I mean, that's a tremendous success story from a, a European capital markets harmonization. Yep. And then I think it's, it's a model that uh, it's understandable why the region would want to try to sort of emulate that success. Yeah. Well, so we've been doing a lot of talking, and I want to make sure that you're awake in the audience. <laughs> so now I propose we go to a polling to get your perspectives. So. If we can go to the questions. So again, you've got what looks like a bloated Blackberry uh, next to you. Uh, there's some numbers on there. You basically, all you have to do is choose the number that reflects the answer that you like and hit green. Questions, please? So, your views. What are the main obstacles for integration and harmonization? The lack of a single regulatory framework, other regulatory challenges, differences in tax regime, lack of investor interest, and lack of business case for market infrastructure. You've got 10 seconds to think through this very complex question. <laughs> um. It seems like we should have some amazing life insights coming after that music. Um, so, number one, lack of single regulatory framework. Sean, anything on here that surprises you, scares you, makes you want to get on a plane to go home sooner? No, I think that's, I mean, I think that's what I would expect. And that, you know, the, the most heartening thing is very few people think it's lack of investor interest, right? So, I mean, I, I think it does reflect that the key challenges really are um, on the regulatory side and, and the framework side. And, and this sort of goes to so what Joe was saying earlier, that you really, the market can only do so much for tr sort of cross-border harmonization. You really do need a policy framework or regulators to help clear the way, and in particular, the tax regimes and the, the, all the other challenges. So I, I would have been surprised if it came out actually any differently. Yeah. And I think Stephanie just as, as said earlier, right, things should be business driven to drive harmonization. And you see number four is actually the one that seems people think is a key driver for mm. wanting it. So, all right, thank you everybody for your participation. So if we, just moving on, I guess, Roland, if you think about regional versus global harmonization, why do we see more harmonization happening at a regional level versus global? Recognizing that in case many investors are global in nature, infrastructure players are global in nature, market facilitation is global in nature. What is your perspective on why we see it more at a regional level versus a global level? I think we should start uh, on, on, on harmonization on a, on a regional level because uh, um, for whatever reason we have not managed to get it on a global view. Yeah? But, uh, in my, in, in a, let's say in my world, I would like to see it on a global basis because I'm working for a commercial bank mm. and adhering to different local rules is a very costly exercise. And we all have to invest an awful lot of money being on a global basis acting, adhering to local rules. It costs a fortune and we don't, and we need money for investing in new products, helping our customers. Yeah, and that's why I'm, I'm re really saying if we have a global standard, we're enabling other market players to act on a global standard. 
So that's why I'm really in favor of a global standard, even if we are saying this is maybe a goal that we're never are ever going to reach, but we should shoot for it. So then what would be some examples? Because you're suggesting kind of global standards with local implementation. So what would be some initiatives that you think we should be taking at a global standard to drive harmonization, as an example? For example, in Europe, we have already started T2S this year with Wave 1, which is a very good standard for securities settlement. Uh, I think this is worth to think about, can we roll out T2S over the world? Can we use that model in other areas, in, in, in other regions? For, this is one of my examples, what I would like to see, using T2S maybe in the Asia-Pacific world. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I guess, Joe, kind of given your role, yeah. uh, and if you think about the challenges um, from a lack of global harmonization, what are the implications? Roland just talked about cost. Yeah. Just maybe coming back on Roland's point on, uh, on T2S, because that's an interesting one. I think uh, implementing target to securities in Europe makes a, uh, makes a lot of sense, because indeed there you have, you have a single currency. Yeah? So people are today, you have different markets sharing all the same currency, so there is a big benefit if you put all that on target to securities, a single settlement engine, so people from a liquidity management point of view, mm -hmm. by definition you, have, you create one single pool of liquidity in Euro. Yeah? That is something you don't have in Asia. I mean, in Asia, you have different currencies. So from a pure liquidity management point of view, you will not achieve a lot. Yeah? Secondly, there's already a lot of harmonization going on into, because it's not only about, if you look at post-trade, it's not only about the settlement side. So you talk about cross-border settlement, and when you talk about cross-border settlement, you talk about cross-border custody. Yeah? So there's a custody aspect to that. And Achieving, implementing target to security, so you will only have the full benefit of target to securities to the extent custody gets further harmonized in all of the markets. So mm -hmm. the post trade needs to be harmonized. I think there, already with uh, the removal of the Giovannini barriers, I think that is a process which is already ongoing into Europe. And the two, of course, target to securities can act as a further catalyst to further harmonization in Europe, but that process is already ongoing. If you try to just put in an, an engine, a T2S engine into the Asian region, not having the same currency, not even having started to harmonize about all these markets, I'm not sure exactly what you try to achieve. So for me, I think, I don't think for Asia, introducing target to securities is the real priority. Yeah? Now, coming back on the um, on global versus, uh, versus regional harmonization, it's coming back to the same point. I think global harmonization, why do we see less global harmonization? Well, Luckily, because there's less of a sort of burning issues at global level. Unless there is a crisis, crisis typically they need to be addressed at global level because these markets, derivatives markets, are global in nature. All these central counterparties, they, they, act, they act globally. And so there is, there is a, an element of interconnectedness or extraterritoriality that you need to address. And we saw that with, the, uh, uh, with that uh, London Whale event. Suddenly, when you see that things can have an impact on, on other countries, other regions in terms of taxpayers are going to be, have to be paid for, a, for an event that is happening in the US, then suddenly it becomes a, a global event. I think the, at regional level you talk more about uh, market, economics, politics. I, I think those kind of things tend to remain more regional. Yeah? Um, I think there's also an element of uh, uh, after post-crisis, post, post -crisis, people tend to go back into the region and address their own concerns at regional level rather than uh, at global level. Uh, and then maybe there are some more practical and operational aspects, the fact that you, you are in different times. I, I agree there are a lot of global players, yeah? but in the end you still have to deal with, uh, from an operational point of view, different time zones and all that. So probably the synergies are higher to start uh, harmonizing regionally than, uh, than immediately at global level. So then if you were kind of to put your futuristic thinking on three to five years, you're basically suggesting that we're going to have regional capital markets potentially as a starting point for integration and also regional market leaders in that? But I, think, I think we need to face some reality here because uh, we always talk about you have U.S. and Europe. U.S., well, the U.S. is a country. Europe is sort of an equivalent, but... Is, is, a, is, a, is, is one big, uh, or aiming at becoming a, a single market. But Asia, of course, becomes also an economic reality. I think going forward, you will have 
each of those three regions probably having each a third of the world economy. Yeah? And I think that is something which uh, today we always saw Asia sort of as a developing uh, a bunch of developing countries. I think that's becoming a, a true big, uh, big region. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just kind of shifting gears, I guess, Sean, um, from your perspective, harmonization clearly ben benefits the banks and the market infrastructure players for all the points that were being raised earlier. What is the upside for investors? Well, I mean, I think the investors win the most, to be honest. I mean, I think the ability, and it depends on what type of investor you're talking about. So if you're talking about institutional investors, the ability to sort of allocate your capital in a more uh, efficient manner and cross-border way is, uh, is a great benefit. I think to the, to the retail investor, the man on the street, the ability to have a more diverse array of investment products uh, is, is clearly helpful. And I think really the purpose of capital markets harmonization is truly to sort of... Uh, fire up the engine of uh, economic growth. And it really, I think it, it, it's a clear benefit um, to, to the investors and to the countries in terms of opening up your, your markets um, to allow for more, to more growth and more financing. Um, in particular, when you look at smaller emerging countries, you know, uh, um, that want to sort of, on their own, might not be able to get the critical mass of a crit uh, capital market to be able to pool that yep. is, is clearly beneficial. So asking a slightly more provocative version of the same question, um, putting it in Asia context, how do countries benefit? Because clearly in Asia, some countries um, have been more proactive in putting up walls versus taking down walls for fear of the implications of capital flight and other countries benefiting versus other countries. So what is your view on how actually, what is the case for harmonization from a country level? How does a country benefit from it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not without its challenges, right? Like, certainly, when you, open your, when you open up your markets to global capital flows, you certainly can see money go in, but it come out just as quickly. And we've seen that in sort of the ongoing emerging market, um, I'll use the term route, but we've seen in, in terms of the last few months with the money being sort of pulled out of emerging market uh, equity fund and bond funds, that certainly has an impact on the market. But I think overall, the, the benefit outweighs the risks and, and are the costs. For a country to open itself up to the global capital markets allows itself to have an engine of growth that it might not otherwise have. Otherwise, uh, isolationism in the long run is not, is not a winning game, I don't think. Yeah. Roland, I guess, what is your perspective on that? How do countries actually benefit from opening themselves up through greater capital markets, harmonization, and integration? I think it's, uh, for, for the countries, it's uh, increasing competition. And uh, the increased competition, in my eyes, really helps the countries and the people living in the countries to, uh, it, it's getting better for them. So yeah. This is uh, building up walls as not the, the way into the future. In my eyes, we should have, let's say, the uh, global markets that real countries also help for their uh, for export, for example. Yeah. Yeah. We'll create more, more uh, em employment and will help the countries uh, and the people living in the countries to stay in their countries because, as I earlier said, uh, young people are leaving uh, in uh, countries with high unemployment rates and those countries don't have a future in my eyes, but it will help them in the open market. So then kind of thinking just at a country level, say Luxembourg or Singapore, uh, you know, are these exceptions or is this something that actually can be replicated in other countries? I would say these are, these are exceptions. exceptions. Can't be replicated, yeah. Okay, fair enough. All right, to make sure you're awake, we're going to go back to you and get your views. Please get your bloated blackberries. Questions, please. So question, who do you think will be the main beneficiaries from further integration and harmonization? Investors? Regional banks and market infrastructure players? Global banks and market infrastructure players? Countries which manage to position themselves at the forefront of harmonization efforts. It's very emotional music, isn't it? <laughs> Global banks and investors as the ones who will benefit those benefiting least out of the four, regional banks and market infrastructure players. Interesting. Roland, any thoughts, <laughs> reactions, emotions? If I would work for a regional bank, 
I would say this is benefit for me because I only have to adopt the one to, to one standard. So uh, it opens a door for me to create new business. So <laughs> that's really interesting for me that we that regional banks uh, do not benefit from it. Yeah, um, this is this is really uh, something uh, I'm a little bit surprised and. Um, what I'm missing is a customer, the end user. Exactly. Because we are only talking about investors and banks and market infrastructures, but we should talk about ourselves. We are also benefiting from it because uh, with an open market, uh, with harmonization, you are tearing down the national monopolies. Yeah? Yeah. So you are creating more competition. So maybe number five, uh, if we would have put number five customers, end users on it, I would hope that these have got uh, the biggest percentage. Yeah. I personally find it surprising, actually, because I can imagine number two being a regional bank, the talent issue, the capital issue, the capacity issue, I can imagine it being very uh, challenging um, from a regional bank to actually have to develop these necessary capabilities to compete mm -hmm. with global and regional banks at that scale. Any other comments from the panel before we move on to some... Yeah, no, I mean, I, think, I don't think the results are surprising. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's encouraging, obviously, that uh, the benefits to the, to the countries or to the investors is pretty well understood. I, I mean, I think when you talked about it a minute ago in the question about, uh, you know, can there be another Luxembourg or what, you know, what, what does it mean? I think um, there are obviously, I, I don't like to think it in terms of winners and losers, because I, I think that sort of paints it in a very stark and sort of unnecessary light, but obviously, centers of excellence and concentrations and network effects happen and certain industries grow in certain places, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you look at uh, the European market, for example, with, with the avenue use, it's Ireland and Luxembourg became the dominant domiciles for funds in the custody banking industry and fund services. But, you know, the UK, Frankfurt became, in Paris, became dominant asset management centers. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not that you lose, it's that certain functions sort of gravity to certain areas. So I think it's just, it's hard to predict what that outcome will be. And I think that's probably the scariest part for market players and participants is to know when you open up these passports and these cross-border projects, how is it going to shake out? Because everyone obviously goes in hoping there'll be, you know, a net that it works out for them, right? You don't do it out of, without self-interest. So I think that's the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think we should have polled as well uh, who the audience works for. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been an interesting uh, conversation to have as well. I, I am surprised with uh, answer number two, our uh, regional banks. Um, I, I think certainly if you look at uh, the Asian zone, um, they do have a number of very strong champions um, mm -hmm. that are already uh, covering those markets uh, and with a clear ambition to continue to grow. So honestly, I'd... I'd probably favor a bit more balanced view on who's going to be winning from the global versus the regional. Um, and, and certainly also because the globals um, have limits, uh, as we all well know since the uh, introduction of Basel III. So that is taking for granted that they can invest anytime, anywhere, yeah. uh, which to me is, might be a bit of a, you know, a biased view. All right. Yeah, maybe just to come when I look at the order, because of course all that is relative, but what strikes me a bit is that the most important one is the intermediate is going to be benefit most, then you have the investor, and lastly you have sort of the, uh, the issuer or the country. I think I would have expected that the first one that should gain or is supposed to gain from, uh, from harmonization or integration should be the issuer, the one that is indeed having needing access to, to capital that's the one that, where everything should be driven by. The second one is then indeed the investor that gets indeed more easy access and have that balance between uh, the demand for, uh, for capital and the provision of capital. And the last one should be the, the intermediary because he's just facilitating the flows between the investor and the issuer. And it's sort of an upside, uh, again, starting from the intermediary's business case then looking at hot money getting into the market, and then as last is the, uh, the market itself. Uh, I think we need to think about more what we call internally in Europe a bit the reverse franchise, mm. thinking it rather than sort of that old model of it's the investor needing to have access to all of these markets, easy access, harmonized access, so that 
not only can money flow easily in, but can easily be retracted when, when things go, uh, go sour. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more, uh, has to be driven from the, from the issuer's uh, perspective, has to be driven from the country, uh, from what yeah. they try to achieve from an uh, economic development point of view. So we're clearly getting divergent views from an audience versus panel. We probably should uh, have filtered who got the bloated blackberries. Maybe people who didn't get enough sleep um, <laughs> uh, represent 90% of the audience in any case. So I just want to kind of move to some kind of closing perspectives, and then we'll, if we have time, we'll open it up for some panel, uh, some panel Q&A. Uh, everybody has an opportunity uh, to answer this one. So looking ahead, you think three to five years out, what are your top three priorities going forward as part of prior, um, harmonization and integration? My top priority in the next three to five years are firstly, I need to fulfill the already existing regulations. I have been on a panel uh, where it was very interesting that some of the current regulations are not known to, to everyone. So this is uh, simply uh, one of the biggest tasks I have to fulfill in the next uh, three to five years. But I want also to start, uh, we are in constant dialogue already with, with regulators and harmonizers. And I want to start not only to have a dialogue with them, I want to educate them. Because really, I'd like to start telling them what the business is about and helping them to find the right level of regulation. Don't get me wrong, regulation is, is a good, and harmonization is the right way, but we have to do it very, very constantly and people, educators, need to talk and listen to us how we should establish the best way of regulation and harmonization. Well, my answer is going to sound awfully like yours, Roland, so maybe that's because our two organizations are very close. <laughs> 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 so I would say that from our point of view, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the bottom of it is, is uh, that we would like to do what we've engaged in, in doing. Um, and that, in terms of priorities, will mean three things, and I'm coming back to one of my earlier points. So three priorities, harmonization of data, harmonization of data, harmonization of data. Yeah. So unfortunately, we've engaged already in a number of harmonization initiatives that are on paper uh, for most of them. It's a long journey, uh, takes years, as Joe was pointing out. Um, so we have to continue. We have to be stubborn about finishing the job. Uh, before thinking of even further uh, uh, mm. initiatives um, and, and definitely go down to, to finish the journey of, uh, of completing uh, harmonizing. Mm. Uh, so again, of course I'm speaking in a swift forum, <laughs> so uh, I'll pray swift, but um, uh, definitely uh, the, it's a key, key, key role in the industry. Uh, you probably promised that we were going to talk about uh, blockchain, etc. Uh, but uh, that would also be uh, one of those, the, their key mandates for, for the future, most probably. So just to clarify, sorry, data harmonization. Sorry? Just to clarify, data harmonization, one, two, and data three. Data harmonization is <laughs> a key priority. Thank you. I, I think taking a look at it sort of a step back uh, as opposed to sort of organizationally, I think at an international level, I, I think what I, I think needs to happen in the, in the next three to five years is there needs to be sort of a peace declared between the EU and US on OTC derivatives reform. So right now, they're in a bit of a staring contest about recognizing each other's regimes, and I, I think that needs to be fixed, uh, and I think we need to get it in place. And I think that goes to sort of a larger point about the struggles of international regulation is at the moment, there seems to be less trust between regulators than there used to be. Um, so you have a lot of people trying to take the lead. When they mean harmonize regulation, they mean really follow my rules, as opposed to recognizing each other's rules. So I, I think we need to get to a place where, where there is more trust between the international regulators so we can have these harmonized rule sets and the markets can function uh, more, more effectively. And I think that's a... I mean, it's a recognized challenge by both sort of the commission and uh, the SEC and the CFTC, but it's, it's something that needs to, I think, really happen the next uh, three to five years. I mean, Lord willing, it happens in the next three to five months, to be honest. But I mean, I, I think that's a key objective at a sort of a very international level. And then paring down to the regional initiatives, I think the CMU, which is the Capital Markets Union in Europe, 
is sort of just kicked off. I mean, this is a generational project. This is not something that's going to be done by their very hopeful deadline of 2019. But in the next three to five years, I think we can get to a point in consultation with, with the, the, the regulators and the European Commission about sort of building the framework and the foundation to really sort of build out the capital markets union in Europe because it, it, that initiative is sort of the first post-crisis initiative in Europe, at least, that's focused on growth again rather than sort of rule setting and um, restrictions. So I think that's a, a great sign. And then I would say, moving on to Asia, I think the fund passports are exciting initiatives. Um, and in particular, when you get to the, the ACN1 or the, the ARFP, you know, you need, I would like to see those sort of key tax issues worked out um, and started to be addressed to give those a real chance at, at liftoff. Because I think as we've seen, historically, I mean, we talk about USIT as a great success, but it wasn't always a great success. It took a while to work the rules out. So I hope that the, the, the regulators in the region here look at the the lessons learned to get to USITS from its first USITS 1 to where we are now with USITS 5 coming to see what fixes were put in to really enable that to be a, a truly cross-border product. Yeah, Yeah. without uh, falling in repetition, because I, I agree, of course, with everything that has been said, I think that for me the three ones are, I think first of all, as was said, we need to finish what we started. I think it's about focusing on a consistent implementation. There's a lot of stuff that is still being implemented. And so we have targeted to securities, the CSD regulation, we have still pieces of MIFID, you have EMIR still has to be implemented. So there's a lot of stuff. I think we need first uh, finish that. And then the second one is, is focus, I mean, put harmonization, uh, regulatory change there where we need it most. And I think it's, it's, that is around uh, economic growth. And we mentioned uh, the capital market union. Uh, which is about connecting money or savers money um, to capital markets. And there it's uh, things like securitization, review of the uh, prospective directive, uh, reporting, accounting, all these kind of things that can, uh, can help to economic growth. Personally, I don't think, of course, we will have the, uh, the introduction of, uh, of target to securities and all the uh, ancillary harmonization uh, efforts that go along, but I don't think that post-trade sort of is the, is the real domain of uh, I think people should focus on uh, what do we need in terms of harmonization for, uh, for real economic growth. And then the last one is, is more around uh, taking stock on the effects of uh, regulatory change. Uh, so what does it all mean and uh, what's the impact of, uh, of regulatory change? And I think an interesting comment, but that's more a personal observation that I had for myself, was around harmonization or lack of harmonization, of course, is a burden. Yeah? And so people are looking at how can we get more uh, towards more harmonization to create more efficiency and the likes. But of course, if you have more harmonization, you have more regulation, you have more centralized regulation, more concentrated regulation, and we're not sure where sort of the right balance is of having sort of the challenge of having to deal with a lack of harmonization versus a very concentrated uh, regulation. Yeah. It's interesting because I think you're all kind of converged on similar themes, right? I'm, I'm sure if, if I'm a, uh, a local regulator, change, especially during market turbulence, is scary. But what you're kind of culminating on is the fact that we need to basically have a message of financial integration and harmonization actually mm -hmm. fosters growth for all participants, be it regional banks, regional infrastructure players, and local investors, as well as global. And you're ultimately saying, we need to educate regulators mm -hmm. so that the fear becomes less daunting and becomes more about excitement. You're saying, get the foundation right, i.e. the data layer, the passport layer, right? And I think ultimately what you're converged on at the end was just being pragmatic, right? Don't start something if we haven't finished what we already started yeah. going forward. Yeah. Well, I think that we now have 10 minutes. We've left 10 minutes for open forum. Now, the requirement is no tough questions. <laughs> now, if you have any questions that are not tough, um, including restaurant recommendations, we're more than happy to take those now. Are there any questions from the floor? Don't be shy. I can imagine any of you are shy. Um, uh, Sean Parker, also from Brown Brothers. One word that has been missing is politics. Um, <laughs> do you think that the financial sector has done a good enough job articulating growth as an objective that's in, uh, that has a common understanding with political will. Because yeah. it seems to me that things like FTT, tax interventions, capital controls, act 
as a cancellation of some yeah. of the growth objectives that you talked about there, and that we have a different obligation to articulate the benefits of those growth of that growth. Yeah. So I said no complex questions, but we'll let that one fly. <laughs> That's a controversial one, not yeah. necessarily a complex one. Any of you uh, brave enough to take that one? Yeah, why not? Um, I, I think it depends on where you are, right? So I think in Europe and to a lesser extent, uh, North America or America, the industry hasn't done a great job sort of explaining it, its intrinsic value to sort of driving growth. I think when you look in Asia, where the, the regulatory agenda has been largely more growth driven in general because the, the financial crisis wasn't uh, as in terrifying as it was uh, in the North Atlantic, I think the industry uh, has a better voice and a better explanation, a uh, better way of sort of positioning itself as, as an engine of growth because you don't see financial transaction tax proposals popping up here and you don't see those sort of those other issues coming up. So I think it really depends on the region. I think incumbent on those of us who reside in Europe or America is really sort of reframing our position to explain what we've been explaining here, that capital markets activity is generally a good idea and that we, we are you know, providing a benefit to the, to the real economy, which the, the politicians are hyper-focused on. So I think the, the short answer is yes and no, but. Well, I'll add some comments. Um, <laughs> You know, for me, I guess I, you know, I started my career probably no, no different than um, many of you. I started my career in Europe and North America, and, and having been in Asia, I give an Asia perspective, probably for the last nine or ten years. You know, Asia integration, which everybody talks about, be it ASEAN integration, you know, uh, the, the China, Greater China integration. It's very exciting, clearly very exciting when you think about the population, the GDP growth, and just the fact that you have huge people, huge volumes of people who are now becoming middle class. It's a very exciting. But I think sometimes the politics, as you rightly say, they come as blocking, not enablers. If you think about it, um, in particular Southeast Asia, everybody is trying to drive growth to take, if I'm Indonesia, 100 million people to middle class. That creates a lot of pressure on politicians. A lot of pressure, right? And taking big risks may or may not be a big risk, but they might perceive it as a big risk, is relatively political suicide. It might be regarded as it. I also think that there's an education element. Uh, there's people, I think, in most Asian markets, be it Vietnam, Indonesia, or some of the other frontiers, regard it as a zero-sum game. I mean, many of us in this room come from markets that have had democracy for many years. Well-functioning, transparent democracy. And some of these other markets, it's still a concept that's developing uh, as they transition from emerging, or frontier to emerging, emerging to emerge, and emerge to leading markets. Um, and I think there's just kind of a cultural attitude that also has to change with that. And I think that one of the amazing things is technology, what technology can do to enable that. I mean, the irony is, is that if you look in China, 70% of new bank accounts are open via digital channels. You've got one of the fastest growing digital populations in markets like Indonesia. Social media is becoming a major uh, democratization mechanism that is only going to drive increasing demands from the investor and the institutional investor for change, be it financial change, political change, or what have you. And hopefully through that, Politics becomes less of a barrier and more of an enabler. Any other, any other questions from the audience? So again, nothing complex and nothing controversial. <laughs> All right, uh, Benjamin Duva, I'm also from Commerce Bank as Roland. I still struggle with the question with who benefits the most because I understand the harmonization is something that reduces complexity, thus entry barriers. So the natural advantage of a global bank is reduced, and it actually gives a regional bank much easier access to markets, as already said. It makes it better for actually the issue and investor, but also for a smaller player to really be able to access the market quite easily, because there's something, nothing new to learn, which a global bank might already know because of mm -hmm. the scale and already have the access. So I'm surprised by the answer, which was earlier, what's the thought on that? In the, the panel. Any responses, reactions? No. Well, I, I'd agree yeah. with yeah. that comment yeah. because that was basically my point, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I want to be mindful that we're kind of we're down to the five minute mark. Any other questions we have from the audience? Otherwise, we'll wrap it up early and let you have tea time. <laughs> 
Well, I don't think there's any yeah. other questions. I just want to personally thank the panelists who had spent time preparing for this over the last many months. I want to thank uh, Cybos and Swift for organizing all of the theatrics. Um, uh, and, and thank you, everybody, for your time and attendance. I hope it was a worthwhile 50-minute investment on your part. Thank you so much. Yeah.